Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Mike Ballard, the CEO of Camino Verde Group, based in Las Vegas. They're a real estate development group and they're actually developing a large project here in Ephraim called Ephraim Crossing, which he'll share more about today. Mike founded the Vegas Valley Angels, a Shark Tank-like investment group, which invested more than $16 million into 24 companies throughout the Western US, primarily Las Vegas. He's helped secure more than $50 million in equity financing for more than 30 companies. In 2014, Mike founded Ascent Multifamily Accounting, a specialized accounting firm serving the apartment industry, which was recognized on the Inc. 500 list, a prestigious ranking of the nation's fastest growing private companies. In 2019, Mike partnered with Kevin Romney to start Camino Verde Group, a real estate development and asset management company with properties in Nevada, California, Utah, Texas, Iowa, Kentucky, and South Carolina. Any others? Probably. Probably some others. Can't think of it. The total development costs of all their projects is more than $250 million. Ephraim Crossing, a 140-acre development in South Ephraim, is one of their projects. Mike is deeply committed to charitable and community service. He has been president of the Las Vegas Rotary Club. He served as a board member of BYU's Business School, the Marriott School of Management, the UNLV Lead Institute for Real Estate Studies, UNLV Technology Advisory Board, and the Editorial Advisory Board for the Las Vegas Review Journal, Nevada's largest daily paper. Mike is married and has four adult children living in Utah. He was a former Little League baseball coach, soccer coach, and served as his son's troop scoutmaster and was a seminary teacher for four years. So please welcome Mike Ballard. Thank you, thank you, Russ. Real quick, um, how many of you are business students? Raise your hand. How many of you are art students? Raise your hand. How many of you are, what other majors are there here? Music, construction, outdoor leadership, great. Um, have any of you already started a business in your careers? Already in your young careers? Awesome, love to see it. What kind of business? Spencer? Online e-commerce, t-shirts. Beautiful. Yeah, uh, sportswear. Sportswear. Anybody back here? Okay. So, um, there are so many ways to start a business. And I wanna say something early on. You don't always need financing from other people many of which you can bootstrap, which is basically self-funding. But uh, what I'd like to share today is a little bit about, if you do need funding, ways to help you do it smarter. We're gonna share some tips and tools on raising capital. Mm. And I'm doing this somewhat out of charity, but also somewhat out of uh, self-interest because uh, we created a company, uh, a community, we're creating a community called Ephraim Crossing on the southeast, southwest part of town. And you know, our goal is to build a wonderful community, you know, safe, quality, good quality of life. And so far we've purchased more than 245 acres. So that bio is a couple years old and uh, we gotta fix that, but so, our branding is just trying to, part of what we're trying to do is get tech companies to relocate people here or to move satellite offices here. We've already succeeded in getting some tech people that work in, tech professionals that work in Utah County or Salt Lake County to live here and then they commute for the one day or two days a week or a month. Um, by the way, I wanna recognize my partner, Joe Gallagher, who's been with me for many years. He's endured both the good and the bad, and uh, he's got his own set of stories he could tell you, but didn't like to, didn't like to talk too much. Okay, um, this is more of our branding of what we're trying to do um, to try and accomplish what we're, what we're doing. And so, and what we're trying to create is a walkable community, somewhat dense and 
and it's a trend that people like to see. There's been surveys of rural Americans, and they like having an inner core while still having the farmland all around or whatever else they have in their rural environment. Uh, let's see. So we're, we're creating this urban shopping area. And I think this is a version of our master plan. And you may have heard uh, a little less than a year ago, Intermountain Healthcare announced that they purchased 39 acres in the middle of our development. And when we first met with them, we thought, we, looked, we knew that they were interested in being in, in Ephraim. And so I looked at their hospital that they have in Richfield, and it's on nine acres. I looked at their hospital in Price, and it's on eight acres. And one of their competitors has a hospital in Nephi, and it's on 14 acres. So Joe and I kind of quickly master planned 15 acres to try and get them to go big. And when we finally met with them, they said, we're not interested in 15 acres. We, our mandate is no less than 35. And I'm like, why? And I explained to them what I just explained to you. And they said, well, don't think Richfield or Price, think Spanish Fork, that new hospital we just built. And I looked it up and it's a $140 million hospital, has hundreds and hundreds of employees. And so when they're gonna do that, again, organizations like that, they don't buy for the 10 years, they buy for 100 years. So whether they do that all at once or in phases, but they weren't interested at all in 15 acres. And I tried to sell them less because I had other plans for part of that space. And then they lowered their price per acre to us. And so they're gonna build something good and special. And we understand the first phase is gonna start construction in less than 18 months. So that'll create jobs, create opportunity for folks. We have in our community, we have planned 10 different residential communities, three single family home communities, three apartment communities, three townhome communities, and one senior age restricted housing community, kind of a retirement home, not retirement homes, but active adult, pickleball, you know, other sports on the complex there. So this is our development. And uh, as part of it, we have this retail core in our town center where we have 38 acres that'll be maybe like Provo's Riverwoods, if you've seen that, or something else. But it'll, it'll be a nice area that'll have some residential, several restaurants, a hotel, office, office space, an incubator space, that type of thing. And so here's where the selfish part of me is talking now. We want folks like you to come up with businesses that can take space in this 30-acre town center of ours, right? Um, we're gonna need probably at least 12 restaurants. We're gonna need, you know, there's, if there's, there's gonna be a thousand different types of homes here in just our community, and they're gonna need places to eat, shop, that type of thing. And we've been talking with several national retailers about coming here, and some are interested, some say it's a little too soon, that type of thing. But uh, just keep that in mind as you think about these business plans and, and that type of thing, because I think there's opportunities here. And, and real quick, <clears throat> everybody take a moment and just think about the largest business that you know of in the area. Walmart? What's another one? What's a locally owned business that's big around here? See, the thing that most people don't realize <clears throat> is there are plenty of big businesses in rural communities. Uh, some that I've met since I've been coming here. One is a, a company called Colby's Kettle Corn. And if you ever smell popcorn at different times of the day, Basically, where the old grocery store was at about 480 South Main Street, the old grocery store now is a manufacturing facility that makes protein bars and popcorn and cheese popcorn and kettle corn and all kinds of things, and they ship it all over the country. Another business that's in the area that I learned of 
is, I think it's CO Building Systems, right? And anybody know anything about them? They make steel buildings and they ship those all over the world. Uh, <clears throat> there's another one down in Gunnison, another few, Freedom Innovations that makes carbon fiber knee braces and shoulder orthopedic supplies. And it started here in San Pete County and they ship all over the world. And that same entrepreneur, he's a carbon fiber um, mechanical engineer. He's also started an, air, uh, an airplane and helicopter parts company with carbon fiber. Then he started a rifle company, Christensen Arms, and makes a carbon fiber. And then he's started now a bike part company or bike frame company with carbon fiber out in Gunnison. And he employs hundreds of people. Another one, uh, Fred and Roxy Johnson. They, I remember meeting them when they just had a few employees, but they make soaps, uh, artisan soaps, and they sell them all over the country. They sell into Kroger's as one of their biggest clients, into Walmart and that type of thing, and they make artisan soaps. And they're basically, I think, on 300 South. And they have, and they're basically been doubling uh, almost every year for about three or four years. And now they have maybe close to 100 employees. I think they've got about 80 employees. There are all kinds of businesses here that you don't know about that create all kinds of jobs. Um, so there was just another one I heard of that I think employees, eight, did you and I were talking about another one? Uh, Oh, Bailey Farm International, they're the largest exporter of uh, alfalfa all over the world. Uh, but they're the largest exporter in the state of Utah by weight for stuff that they ship by weight. So there are all kinds of businesses that you can start. And there's, there's plenty more that I haven't named. So just know that whatever you can dream, you can make happen uh, with lots of hard work. So I'm going to talk about sources of investment, an overview of venture finance, talk about ideas versus opportunities, uh, getting through stage one, and then some of the tools, one of which is this executive summary here. So the sources of capitals, sources of capital. Um, if you do need money, this is where you get it, right? Friends and family, oftentimes the first start. Sometimes it can ruin relationships if you don't do it right. So we're going to try and give you some tools on how to do it right. And I'll, I'll give you all the slides and so he can, you can just have the deck. Um, but there's lots of different types of groups. One thing interesting, the thing that brought us uh, to Ephraim was opportunity zones and new market tax credit zones. This whole city has so many beneficial designations that allows companies here to get funds outside of normal financing. And so we actually, Colby from Colby's Kettle Corn called me about three, four and a half years ago and basically said, hey, I hear you did this cool financing for a company in Orem, Utah. One of the guys involved in that company is involved in our company and he said, I should talk to you. We talked a few times on the phone and then Joe and I started coming to Ephraim and started working with Colby and helped him get financing to grow his business from a smaller location to almost tripling the size of his location here and then ultimately buying the building that he's in. Uh, all of Ephraim is something called an opportunity zone. So if people invest and follow certain rules in companies or real estate in Ephraim, when they sell it, they pay no taxes. So imagine building a $100 million business and selling it in 15 years and then paying no taxes. Opportunity zone legislation is what allows that to happen. And so we're gonna talk about some of these. Okay, venture capitalists. Everybody thinks of venture capitalists when it comes to raising money for startups, okay? And they are oftentimes the worst source of funds. There's, 
They're made up typically of general partners that are uh, MBAs, salaried employees. They put no skin in the game most of the time and they take a big part of the upside. Their investors are oftentimes endowments, you know, the Harvard endowment, the Stanford endowment, a lot of major organizations, uh, they only invest, or they invest a significant portion of their capital into venture firms or private equity firms. And a number of uh, venture firms only take money from nonprofit endowments. And so, an endowment. So like Snow College wants to have an endowed chair, let's say. And so they have, testing one, two. So somebody will contribute money, let's say a million dollars or two million dollars for an endowed chair for a professorship. And they can't use the principal, they can only live off the interest or the gains. And that's what pays for the salary or for a new building or for other operational costs of a major nonprofit organization, oftentimes universities. Okay. Uh, angel investors. Anybody ever heard of angel investors? Okay. Well, the definition's up there. They're typically wealthy individuals that can invest in companies. Shark Tank acts like angel investors. If you ever watch Shark Tank on TV, okay? And there are multiple angel investment clubs in Utah, in Nevada, in, in dozens, if not hundreds in California. So there's angel groups all over. Um, there's one in Reno, there's one in Tahoe, there's one in Vegas. Um, there's in Provo, Salt Lake, and other areas, and just a group of wealthy folks get together so that they can kind of review a deal together because everybody can see a deal, you know, and assess the risks and benefits of any potential opportunity together. But oftentimes, they invest smaller amounts in venture firms, but some can write pretty big checks, and, and they're involved. They, wanna, they oftentimes want to be more involved um, the motivation of venture capital is pretty much one thing, make money. They're all significantly greedy from what I can tell, which is not a, necessarily a bad motivation, but angel investors oftentimes have multiple motivations. Yes, they want to make money, but they also want to help. They want to mentor. They want to uh, provide, provide some sort of assistance or give back to the community. Angels and VCs, most years, invest about the same amount. It's just that venture capital firms invest in fewer deals with bigger dollars, and angels invest in larger deals with fewer dollars. Another way to look at it is oftentimes most people go to angels first to get the smaller dollars to ramp up to qualify to be worthy of the attention of venture capital firms. And so... Okay, so let's talk about creating the opportunity. You know, I want you to take a moment and think of an idea that could be a business, right? Could be for one of these competitions, uh, but think about that for a second. What is your big idea? And I'm amazed at how often Great ideas come out of the woodwork for folks. Okay. I want you to think big. There's a wonderful book that I highly, I'm going to recommend about five books today. One of which is The Magic of Thinking Big. I think it's by Michael Schwartz or William Schwartz or somebody, but The Magic of Thinking Big. And uh, this is a quote from President Roosevelt that I love. It is Better to dare for mighty things, to win glorious triumphs, even though checkered with failure, than to rank among the poor spirits who neither enjoy nor suffer much because they live in the gray twilight that neither knows victory nor defeat. Life is worth living. Try stuff. Fail. Get up. Try again. Get up. Try again. You know, we have plenty of challenges. 
Joe and I, over the 13 years of working together, we've had plenty of challenges, and we're hoping the next one's the big one, right? And so, but think big. So I want to talk about, many people would come to our angel group. We would have, when we started our angel group, we ended up at our, at our peak, at our best time, we had 55 wealthy people that would listen to presentations where we'd be in the audience and the entrepreneur would come up here and um, we would have 80 companies a year apply to present to us. Half of those weren't businesses to fund, they were ideas that needed more work, more info into them. And so we would, we would immediately discard 40 to 60 of those 80 that applied every year. And then we'd let 20 present to us every year, typically two companies a month, 10 months out of the year. Would be off in October, August and would be off in December. And out of those, 20 that presented, we'd be interested in about five. And then out of those five, would do something called due diligence, where we check, did everything they told us, was that true? Did we verify that it's a big market? Did we verify that there's almost no competition? Did we verify you know, that they have the resumes that they have? That type of thing. I mean, doing due diligence once, we found out that the founder had a criminal record and really, and he was trying to sell something to the government. It was a security service. And uh, he may have gotten the idea from his crimes, who knows. But when we did his due diligence, we said, nah, we don't think we should invest in that. And we found out that he also had pitched three other angel, firm, angel groups um, in Arizona and California. And we were just um, the next in line. And so an idea is, an, is not necessarily uh, a fundable entity, but an opportunity is. And oftentimes... And this is, this is not necessarily for you, but this is for more of the, the California and the big city stuff. But they have a management team partially in place, if not fully in place. We think their business can be scalable you know, to more than 30 million in revenues. And VCs like to see how can you get to 100 million in revenues quick. How close are you to having customers that are willing to write you checks? And again, all the slides are going to be Available, I can send them to you this afternoon. Uh, you know, high gross margins, right? Once you pass break even, you're mostly profitable. And they serve a big enough niche market that you can get to 30 or 100 million in revenues and you hold some sort of unfair competitive advantage, right? And so we would, as angel investors, we would weight the companies that would go through, we would score them with this kind of weighting, uh, okay? So take a second and write down three ideas, if it, one or two or three, of a business that you might start. And then I'm gonna share with you a journey that I helped a gentleman go through who is already successful, um, okay? That clock's a little fast, so good. Okay, I want to talk about growing an idea into an opportunity. Anybody ever, do you know who Nick is? Okay, I met Nick when he moved his company to town. He had a company called Zappos. And Zappos sold shoes online. Anybody heard of, you've heard of Zappos because you're from Vegas, yes. Elon, right? So everybody knows Tony Shea, but Tony was the guy who came in after. He was the angel investor that funded Nick. And then as they kept growing, as Tony kept putting more and more money in, he finally said, I'm no longer an angel investor. I'm going to be, I put in enough money, I want to be CEO. And he had control, he put in enough money to take over the company. And so Nick, when, when they moved to Vegas, Nick was kind of, he was still the founder, but he really had no other job titles because Tony had pushed him aside. And so what they had him do was just be an evangelist and he would speak at all kinds of organizations in Vegas. 
And I happened to be involved in a number of different organizations in Vegas, and so I got to meet him. Then we started talking, and then one day we went to lunch at a restaurant called Bahama Breeze in Vegas. And as we started chatting, he expressed frustration. He said, you know, I go into meetings now, and we've hired, you know, Zappos has grown. I'm the founder, but I'm no longer president or CEO. And I go into these product meetings, and I make suggestions, and they say, yeah, yeah, yeah. But I'm the former VP of marketing at Nordstrom's and or product buying, you know, at Nordstrom's. And so this is what I think. And they ignore me. And then I go into this other meeting and I talk and I'm kind of not significant in the company that I founded. And um, as he said that, I said, Nick. And he, one of the cool things that he said, and he did say he, there were several perks that he did have at his job because he said, I called somebody that was one of the lead, the guy who runs the Black Eyed Peas, and I apologize, I don't know. Yeah, Will I Am, but not Will I Am, another one. Somebody else, and it wasn't Fergie, but it was the other one. Is there another one? Somebody, he called somebody at Black Eyed Peas, and he says, they call me back. And I said, that is pretty cool. You know, that you can call famous people and you can say, I'm the CEO of Zappos and everybody knows what Zappos is, or I'm the founder of Zappos and whatever. So I said, Nick, I think you should quit. He says, how can I quit? I'm the founder. I says, founders quit all the time. And I listed off some. It happens. Steve Jobs was no longer at Apple for a while, right? Quit. Can they take away your title of founder of Zappos from you? No. Do you think they're going to be mad at you if you quit? And he says, no, actually, I don't think they're going to be mad at me. I said, you should quit. And now you have the tickets or the experience, the resume to start something new. And if I were you, I would start something new in, in the apparel business, right? You've already got a reputation as founding this company. And he told me the story about how he founded it. And I got to tell you real quick, and I know I'm going to, I'm taking a short story and making it long, but when he first started Zappos, he believed that people would buy shoes. And he went to all kinds of money people and said, I believe people will buy shoes online. And they said, no, they won't. They really want to try them on. And he said, yes, they will, because people buy shoes from magazines today. And from what I understand, it's more than a $2 billion business buying shoes out of magazines. And all these VCs said, pound sand, get away, get out of my face. It's not going to work. And he said he called over 400 VCs for money. And so, but he had one guy that said, show me that people will buy online. And his first website was called shoesite.com. S-H-O-S-I-T-E. And he would go to his mall and he specialized in vans. So he would, he said uh, to the, the manager at the van store, he said, can I take pictures of a bunch of your van shoes, please? And I promise I'm going to sell them online and I'll buy them from you. And so he would go take eight pictures of these shoes, post them online, built a website because he was a programmer. I think he had a degree in something way, nothing related to programming, by the way. And He'd take all these pictures, put them online, and start basically selling. And at first, he was selling one in three weeks, and then one a week, and then a couple a week, and then a couple of days. And he would go to the mall, buy the shoes, and mail them. And then he went to the one guy, and he said, what do you think? He says, you proved you can do it. That's awesome. Uh, and I think he basically raised m money from his father-in-law and a couple other people, but he really didn't get much money. But he went to a shoe show in Vegas, one of the conventions, and talked to group into selling them shoes cheaper. And he did that, but then he would have them mail it. And then pretty soon they said, we're done mailing individual boxes to people. We're going to ship you. And it just became a nightmare and he decided to move the company to Vegas and he ended up quitting. And I said, think of something 
and let's meet in a week. And he sent me an email first thing in the morning said, I could not sleep. My wife couldn't sleep. We're jazzed. I'm quitting today. Now at the time, Zappos was probably worth, uh, Zappos was probably worth a couple hundred million dollars. He had a small house, smaller than mine. You know, they were putting every dollar they made back into the company. They weren't profitable. And they weren't profitable through nine rounds of financing. And he had a smaller house at the time that we were having this discussion than I had. And he said, I can't sleep. I've, I'm coming up with ideas. Let's schedule an appointment. And so we schedule an appointment. And he came up with a diet, uh, an idea for a company he created called Stagger. And about the same time as we started interacting a couple times a week now, one of my buddies, the guy who was my best man actually, was one of the executives that helped start UFC. And so I would get front row seats to UFC fights all the time when UFC was a lot smaller than it is today. But it was pretty cool. And I bring him there and uh, he just falls in love with it. But he wants to create custom... Uh, to, he would call brands and be able to use brands, but people could put their name on the back of a shirt, like a jersey, or they could customize it in a couple different ways approved by the brand. And so he created this company called Style and Graphics, and his acronym was Stagger, and he bought Stagger.com, and he started the company. But as, we, as he started going, he started getting into MMA big time and loved going to see UFC fights. I brought him to another one, and he started, he, he ended up merging his company with Dethrone, made all kinds of great money with Dethrone, and uh, was able to fund it himself. Pretty A few years later, Amazon bought Zappos for $1.2 billion, and he still had about 10% of the company, so he made about $120 million, ends up being a minority owner in the Golden State Warriors and some other companies and has big houses in multiple places all over the country. But it started with an idea. And, you know, he, one of the things we would, he and I would go to breakfast after he wrote down, I said, write down your idea or three ideas first, kind of like what I'm asking you to do in one paragraph, describe them in one paragraph. And then I'm going to have you meet somebody that I know that can fund retail projects you know, apparel related things. And so we sat down for breakfast at a local casino and he got some criticism and picked one idea. And then I said, okay, now take this one idea and answer four questions and come back in a week and I'll put you in front of some more of our angels that made a lot of money in retail. And he did that and pretty soon he built his business plan. So again, we, we rated them. So, uh, We've got about nine to 12 minutes, right? 10 minutes, okay. So think about what do you want? What does the investor want? Sometimes you have leverage, sometimes you don't, okay? But there's four tools that you should create on your fundraising journey. Some of these, and we'll talk about some of these. The elevator pitch, right? Typically a 30 second to two minute how can you explain your business on a 20-story elevator ride? You know, how can you do it? An executive summary, which is, this is an example of a one, I should say one to four page, but typically, or maybe it's one to two page, where you have described key parts of your business in a small amount of time. One is your pitch deck, your PowerPoint deck, and have one is a financial forecast, and that's what Joe did with us many times. And then we would have a debate. Many of the angels demanded a full business plan. Many of us didn't because we said it's angel funding, it's early round. We're going to help them build the business plan over the first few months. And then if somebody likes you, they're going to give you a term sheet. Under these terms, I'm willing to invest in you. So let's talk about this real quick. One of the things is the one-liner. It's kind of the this first start of the elevator pitch. It's five to 10 word line that articulates the business. Let's go to that right now. Our business enables customers to do this. 
right? We've created E from Crossing so that they can have kind of a, a, a more rural Utah experience while still having the benefits of a big city. You know, we network networks, you know, that type of thing. I don't know, when I transform this from one, it's adding a lot of S's in there, so. Uh, so there's some one-line examples. The elevator pitch, what market are you in? What's the problem you're solving, right? This is stuff that I know uh, Russ is sharing with you guys. Find a problem and solve it, right? Why you can win. Why can your team win when others won't? Do you have an unfair advantage? Like selling sports gear for your team and you're um, on the team. That's an unfair advantage that most of the class can't have. You know, that type of thing. You know, where's the validation? Do you have customers? Do you have investors that already believe in you? Have you generated revenue? Here's a sample elevator pitch for that one velocity company that we used. We're a four-year-old company. We did more than a million and a half in sales. We solved this problem. You know, we've already generated revenues. It's a, you know, high bandwidth connections are big, yada, yada, yada. Right, here's another one. Diamond develops proprietary thin film diamond products and equipment that dramatically improve heat dissipation for microprocessors, solving one of the highest priority pain points in the processor industry. You know, these are just examples, but you should practice this. You should have it canned. Don't look like a deer in the headlights, right? There's significant money that you could win in these business plan competitions, right? And can you mention that you're gonna be back? Yeah, I'm coming back in November as one of the judges. Um, and I know we're, I think we're contributing at least 500 towards it. What's the total amount you potentially are giving away? $7,500, right? And we want to maybe, we're still figuring out how we want to do it, but I think our goal is to fund companies that'll employ people in Ephraim that can serve people outside of Ephraim, okay? So, or maybe it's San Pete County, but we want you to be in our area, right? So you gotta, you gotta know this stuff, have it down. And I'm gonna go quick because we don't have much time. Tell a story. A story is what ties people in, helps them to understand. Part of the story that brought Joe and I to Ephraim, as we were doing this tax credit transaction for Colby's Kettle Corn, we started, Colby was complaining he couldn't find housing for his in-laws that wanted to move in the area so they could be closer to their grandbabies. And then other people kept saying, there's no housing. Other people kept saying, there's no housing, there's no housing. And we know something about building things, right? So we thought, okay, you know, and we got enough encouragement from people and especially one big investor. And so we said, we called a broker and we said, tie up some land. And she found 14 acres and that was the start. So that's our story. And then, you know, now we're leasing townhomes. Every time we build a new fourplex, we get 20 applications for four spots. That's a story, right? It makes it compelling. So get your, find your story. Maybe it's a good thing, maybe it's a bad thing and how you solved the bad thing. So be prepared. One of the things too is your slide deck. Most slide decks are less than 20 pages. There's a book, the next book I'm recommending is by Guy Kawasaki. He was the chief evangelist for Apple computers, and then he became a consultant, and he wrote a book called The Art of the Start. And it's a great book if you wanna learn about how to build a company. And, um, but one of the things that many authors talk about when it comes to raising money is there's 12 magic slides, and I can't go through this because I've got so little time, but the, the, the slides are these. And again, the whole handouts will be available to you. The title slide, overview problem. You can read all this, you'll have it later. The title slide, give basics of what you're trying to accomplish, who you are, how to get a hold of you, how much money you want. Here's an example. I'm gonna go through these real fast. The overview, two to five high level bullets. I like three or less personally, right? Here's one. Here's another one. A few bullets, some graphics that explain 
Again, if you're nerds, you'll understand this. I don't really, but it's an example I took from somebody, right? The next slide is the problem. Where's the pain? How do you, how do you fix it? You know, talk about the pain, how bad, what are the consequences of not fixing a problem, right? Next slide, here's, well, actually, so here's some examples. Okay, the solution. What, what is our solution and what are the benefits of it? How are we unique? Right? Talk about how big the market could be. There's all kinds of people relocating from all over the country and some of them want to be here. I just need a thousand of them. Right? Here's ways to discuss the market. What's our technology? What's our special sauce? Why are we different? What's our competitive advantage? Why, why, if I have this idea and somebody finds out about it, why can't he do it as well as I can? What, what unique things do I hold? Okay, who are the competitors? Who do I gotta beat out to win? What's our go-to-market strategy? Now you take your projections, you put them in here. You'll get the, who's our team? What's our current status? And then a summary. Those slides are important. Covering those topics are important, okay? And understanding those, and oftentimes for me, the elevator pitch, the story, the one-liner, the goal and the executive summary, the goal is to get the appointment. Right, I meet somebody in the elevator, I give them the elevator pitch, they give me their card, then I send them the executive summary, the one or two or three page document. That goal is to get the appointment, don't send the deck, right? And then once I have the appointment, then I present personally and make the pitch. Uh, think big, try hard, be honest, keep a good reputation, these, these seven things are the keys to success. It's okay to fail. It's the only way you learn. Oftentimes, many entrepreneur, many angels don't like to fund people that haven't failed gloriously once. Right? Because you don't know what you don't know until you've tried it the wrong way. <laughs> right? So, I want you to know there's opportunity for all kinds of different companies right here. We want to see it happen right here. So go make it happen. Try, fail, get up, try again. It's easy if you're willing to try hard and be resilient. Thank you very much.